Okay, hello and welcome to another Paro Seminar. Uh, this Paro Seminar is uh, coming off the back of a two-week book study that I just did uh, with a group of you uh, based on an essay in this book, um, God, the Gift and Postmodernism. Really recommend this book. I, I love it. It was actually quite central to um, my master's thesis. I uh, wrote on this debate between Jean-Luc Marion and Jacques Derrida, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. So definitely recommend this book. If you get it, um, the essays in the name and the uh, other essay called Apostles of the Impossible are two really good essays that are in it. So we just did a two week uh, book study on that. So I thought I would do the Paro seminar on that theme as it's kind of clear in my mind. Um, and also because many of you have been interested in mystical theology and its connection to paro theology and whatnot. So I thought this is a good, uh, a good essay to kind of explore those issues. So what I want to do um, over the next 45 minutes or so is um, give a broad uh, definition of deconstruction and then of what's called denomination or mystical theology. I want to look at those two because in the 90s when this book was written, there was an interesting debate going on between Jacques Derrida and Jean Luc Marion and others about were deconstruction or post-structuralism was similar or different to mystical theology. So this was this interesting debate because you think of deconstruction as a more kind of for want of a better word, like a secular kind of philosophical concept, mystical theology is much more narrowly religious. Um, and so there is an interesting discussion about where they interconnect. So I'm going to do a broad look at what deconstruction is, a look at what mystical theology is, and then um, uh, see, I'll leave it to you to decide which one you like more. <laughs> um, what else should I say about that? Um, Oh yeah, the other reason why it's interesting to do this is deconstruction has a bit of a bad name these days. So deconstruction is associated with post-structuralism and post-structuralism is associated with post-modernism. And what you'll hear if you're on YouTube and you watch these YouTube videos is there's quite a few people who are very critical of post-modernism as a form of relativism. Um, so you'll have people like, um, say, Jordan Peterson or, um, oh, there's this... Who's, uh, there's a woman who is I quite, uh, he's very good on these things, but she hates postmodernism, her name escapes me. Um, but there's various people like that who will have kind of critical analysis of post postmodernism as a type of almost like um, it's almost like this French virus that got into American universities and has kind of created a type of relativism and is responsible for a lot of the, the things that we see coming out of the educational establishment today, right? And um, I can understand, actually, there's something to that critique. Um, I, there's a grain of truth to it. Like all critiques, there's, there's often a grain of truth, but it's only a grain of truth. Um, because one of the things someone like Jordan Peterson talks about, for example, is Marxism and postmodernism, that Marxism kind of turned into a cultural Marxism, which is postmodernism, and postmodernism basically took Marxist ideas and dispersed them through uh, culture. So kind of postmodernism became a way of um, analyzing cultural institutions from a Marxist perspective, and then that came into America and then kind of created kind of the kind of woke culture that we see today, right? Those are all very different things in reality. Postmodernism and Marxism have never sat comfortably together in the academy. There's lots of debates uh, between them. Um, definitely Marxism didn't become post-structuralism or postmodernism. Um, although there are elements of postmodernism that connect with Marxism, but they're actually quite different. So there's this interesting kind of like a um, theory of how America got to the place it is through postmodernism, which is this, you know, as I say, this manifestation of, of Marxism in the cultural arena. I don't know why I'm telling you all this because I'm not going to talk about that today. It just interests me. Um, but I am going to try to um, look at what postmodernism is and show why, yes, there is a little bit of 
uh, it's not relativism, but you can see why people think oh, postmodernism is where basically anything goes. Anything you say can be critiqued. All you have to do is out narrate the other. You can't reason with other people. Your, your experience of the world is different from my experience of the world. So we can't rationally communicate. All we can do is give our truth. All we can do is kind of, I can express how I experience the world. You express how you experience the world. And really all that matters is um, power relations. All that matters is oppression and oppressor and the ways those kind of play out in society. But there is no universal, there's no connection between us. There's no connection to some sort of truth, right? So that's, that's the kind of the very simple critique. Um, that is not what postmodernism is. Postmodernism is the popular term for poststructuralism. And then deconstruction is, a, you could maybe say, is the, is the key concept with or one of the key concepts of post-structuralism. So, okay, so what is deconstruction? Mm. Um, I wanna kind of more paint a picture of, of how deconstruction feels. Um, deconstruction is a way of thinking that is always open to uh, absence, to something that is not said. So key, to deconstruction is a critique of what's called the metaphysics of presence. So the metaphysics of presence is a term that is used in philosophy sometimes to describe the idea of presence being better than absence and presence having more substance than absence and presence being preferable to absence, right? And one of the key ways that that expresses itself in our experience of life is, uh, I think comes from Aristotle, where you think of time, right? You have the present, right? That's present. What is happening right now is present. I'm talking to you right now. Um, the past is absent, it's gone, and the future has not yet happened, so it's absent. So there's kind of absence on either side and presence in this moment. So people talk about the eternal now. They talk about living in the present, right? They talk about in the primacy of what is over what has gone or over what will happen. And you'll hear people saying, you know, the past is gone, try to let it go. The future, don't worry about that because it hasn't happened. Live in the present, experience the present, experience what is. So that notion is, is, is a concrete manifestation of what, of this notion of metaphysics of presence. And what Derrida does, very interestingly, is he takes Heide, the philosopher Heidegger, who basically says this preference of presence over absence has been in the philosophical tradition pretty much from the very start. Right? There's been a real privilege of it. And in fact, even at the very beginning of philosophy, there's been a privilege of presence over absence in the figure of Socrates. Because Socrates never wrote anything down. He spoke, he debated. It was all about doing philosophy in the present with people. If you write something down, then you're absent. You can't, you can't debate with a text, right? That the person is gone, that the text is present but the individual who wrote it is absent. And so right at the beginning of philosophy, you know, um, Derrida says speaking, presence, the idea of me being here in front of you is seen as somehow preferable. And Derrida wants to question that, right? And Derrida wants to say that absence isn't on either side of presence, but everything that is present has a type of absence within it. And you can think of this in lots of different ways. You can think about it in terms of people you love, right? If you love somebody, they're present, they're there with you, but there's always so much of them that you don't know, that's still to be discovered. Um, so much, not simply things that you don't know that they could tell you, but things they don't know about themselves, or things that, parts of them that haven't flourished or come into being. So whenever you know someone, you, you experience them as a type of universe, a type of presence with absence. But Derrida also says the very nature of language is something in which um, our ethical and our religious and our educational establishments, when they teach us 
um, and they give us these words like justice and love and mercy and ethics. These words, and there's two things we can say about them. One is that they obviously change context depending on the time in history that you're using those words. So there is slippage in, in how words function. And we, we kind of, we all understand that. We never, my understanding of justice is different from somebody in the fifth century in Germany and might be different from somebody who lives today, but in a, a completely different country, right? In South Africa or something like that. So we understand that there's a certain slippage within words. Um, that words can change their meaning when they're put into different contexts. And deconstruction is very sensitive to that, very sensitive to how words uh, change their meaning in different contexts. So when you read a book today that was written 100 years ago, it kind of speaks differently because it's in a different context. Uh, different things have happened in history. And in some ways, you can't quite read it the way the, per the people read it maybe a hundred years ago, you read it differently, not, a, not in a worse way, um, sometimes in a better way. You know, you can have more distance from the book and more people have written about that book and so you can kind of like have more insight. Uh, so like if you're reading someone like Hegel, Hegel's so hard to read that, you know, we benefit from hundreds of years of people writing about the books that he wrote. <laughs> it kind of give you better access to them than if you were reading them at the time. So deconstruction is sensitive to that, but at a more fundamental level, it's sensitive to the idea that justice is different from itself. Um, that, that whenever, so taking the example of justice, but God is a similar word, um, love, mercy, forgiveness, right? These are all different from each other. God, justice, mercy, forgiveness, grace, these words are slightly different from each other. There's, there's connections, but they're all slightly different from each other, but they're also different from themselves. So there's something about the word justice that never captures justice. Whenever you try to create a just society, uh, there's something always missing. There is some element of injustice within it. Uh, and deconstruction you could almost say the faith of deconstruction is where an individual sensitizes themselves to that absence within presence. To, so whenever someone says, we have a just society, this is the just society, the deconstructionist is the one who goes, no, no, no. Because, because justice always has an element that's unfulfilled within it. It always has an element of a call, of a new possibility, of an openness to something else. As soon as you think that justice is fully present and you have it, you've lost it. Same with beauty. You're, if you're trying to capture beauty as an artist, if you think you've done it, like, uh, you know, it's like every time someone writes a book or whatever, you know, you want to write the book that ends all books, right? You want to make the documentary that ends all documentaries. You take the photograph. I was talking to a photographer friend of mine and I was going to interview him for something and um, I was saying he uh, that he could kind of, talk about how he wants to take the photograph that stops anyone from taking photographs again, right? So in other words, the photograph that as soon as someone sees it, it's like, oh, I'm not even going to try and take a photo anymore because that, that, that's just the perfect photograph or that's the perfect song. There's no point writing another song because that's the perfect song. Now, of course, that's absurd. Um, but sometimes you kind of, it's nice to think like that when you're writing, you go, I want to write the definitive work on this subject. And that can maybe animate you, but you always fail. You don't take the perfect photograph, paint the perfect painting, make the perfect meal. And the deconstructionist is the one who is always sensitive to the failure within the success. It's always going like, you, the artist is drawn to beauty. They're trying to capture beauty, but beauty is always elusive. It always escapes. And yet, it's not that beauty is absent from the painting. It's just not completely contained in it. It's not completely crunched into it and captured in it. There's something more. And, a, and a, a really beautiful painting can bring you beyond itself. You look at the painting and it brings you somewhere else. So it kind of draws you into what you cannot see. Now that's a position that, you know, Derrida says is part of language. That's how language functions. Whenever you talk about God or justice or love or mercy, there is 
There is a not at oneness. There is an absence within the presence of those things. When you think you've nailed them down, you haven't nailed them down. You've missed something. Um, but also there's a politics to that. There's a sense in which you can see why this might be a very useful thing, that there's a danger, uh, what in religion they call idolatry. There's a danger of thinking that you have got love so and down. You know what it is to love someone. You know what a loving politics is. You know what justice looks like. You know what mercy looks like. You know what forgiveness looks like. And it's present. And it's present in your society. It's present in your community. There's a danger to that. And it's a very strange danger because it's the danger in which you're the body precisely in thinking you're the goody. Uh, and this is very important, right? Because the old saying that Bad people will do bad things, but to get good people to do bad things, you need to give them ideology, right? So it, yeah, bad people are gonna do bad things. You don't need to try to convince them to, right? You have to try to convince them not to. But let's say the vast majority of people are pretty good and they do wanna do bad things. Well, then what you have to do is you have to get them to do bad things in the name of the good, right? In the name of love, in the name of justice, in the name of mercy, um, to, in the name of tolerance to become intolerant in the name of justice to become unjust, in the name of forgiveness to become unforgiving. And Derrida, is, I suppose the deconstruct of faith is a faith that's always trying to avoid that. And it avoids it by always being open to the call or the impossibility that is within the community. So you always say the law is not justice. The law that we have, it can always be improved. It can always be developed. It is fluid and it is moving. So if you're kind of following this along, you can see how this is not relativism, right? It's Derrida is not saying, you know, justice can mean anything at all. He's not saying that so much as he's saying that there is a quantum dimension within the word justice. And by quantum dimension, what I simply mean is there is a uh, undecidability or a um, uh, something that cannot be uh, measured or defined within the term and if you want to basically have a defi definition of justice you need to include what it doesn't include you need to include this openness to the future so it is a messianic position messy you know looking forward to the messiah the truth is not here but we are wanting it to come it is a type of eschatological philosophy it's looking to the future to, to always look into a justice to come. So Derrida uses this term of the to come, the justice to come, the mercy to come. There's always this, this openness and this sensitivity to, to what is not within what is. Right? So hopefully that's clear to some extent. By the way, the, the theologian of deconstruction is John Caputo. And uh, if you read his book, a beautiful little book called On Religion, is a good example of a deconstructive theology because it's a theology of longing for the future, of hope, of faith in the future, of hope and of love, that is, that never grasps what it's caught up in. So at the beginning of that book, he takes a phrase from Augustine, from book 10 of the Confessions, where Augustine says, what do I love when I love my God? And Caputo loves this, right? So it's a great place to start. He says, what Augustine is saying is there's something in the name of God and in the name God that I don't know. I don't know what I love when I love God. I, I love and I love God, but I don't know what it is I love when I love God. And Caputo says that is uh, a type of deconstructive faith. It's a faith that, that loves God, or you could say justice, you do the same thing. I love justice, but I don't know what I love when I love justice, right? It's that, it's that commitment it's that positioning and yet that kind of unknowing, that sense that there's something in this word that I cannot grasp. Um, and this is why, by the way, because I, I think the word deconstruction has become popular within some religious circles. Um, I see it used a fair bit, but sometimes people use it in this non deridean way. And what they say is either deconstruction is a pulling apart, right? You've got a system and it didn't work. And so you're, t you're taking it apart, you're, you're tearing it down. And then sometimes then the person will say, in order to reconstruct. And so either deconstruction is a period, a season in your life, and it's something you do to a system that didn't work. 
For Derrida, that's not the case. For Derrida, deconstruction is something you always do. It's a one tries to sensitize yourself to it. It's always happening. Deconstruction is a position one takes, and not just to positions that don't work, to systems that don't work. So I say, oh, I'm deconstructing my Christianity, um, or I'm deconstructing my, my Buddhism or my humanism or whatever it is. It's like, no, the deconstruction, it's like, yeah, the system you're in might not work for you and you and might have been bad, that's one thing, but deconstruction is simply saying that whatever system you have, there's, an, there's a possibility within it. There's a promise of something else. And whatever worldview you find yourself in, what deconstruction means a type of sensitivity to that openness within that tradition. And as you follow that openness, as you kind of go that narrow path, it might take you out of that religion you're in, or it might take you deeper into it or whatever, but it's, a, it's really a form of holding what you have, a way of sensitizing yourself to what is absent within what is present. Um, so it's not narrowly defined within, say, Christianity. So Derrida is going like, deconstruction happens everywhere. It's always happening in language. It's happening in the world. And um, when we deny it, when we cover over deconstruction, we end up becoming violent. There's a violence. Um, we, the t the, one of the terms for this absence is the holy other. Right? So it's called otherness or alterity or the holy other is terms you'll hear in philosophy. And what that kind of means is an openness to something that you don't know. <laughs> you don't know what it is, but you're open to it. As soon as the holy other is something that you can predict, that you know, it's not holy other, it's the same. So sameness and alterity, there's philosopher Emmanuel Levinas is very good on this one. It's like, um, and this is, this is, again, you've heard me many times of say why I'm con concerned about some forms of progressivism. But it's partly sometimes because the holy other is missing, right? One knows the right side of history, one knows where things are going and you're just trying to get there. And if someone isn't thinking the way they should be thinking, you can still love them, but in kind of patronizing way, because you know you're right, right? You have the answer. What Levinas and Derrida and people like that are saying is that there's a dimension to reality that is wholly other, which means you can't know what it is. You can't predict it. You don't have it. And if you close yourself down to the wholly other, what you end up is with the same. All you end up with is the present and, and basically a projection of yourself, right? And your own ideals and your own thoughts. And those might be very good and they might actually be the, much more helpful for the world than other positions, absolutely. The problem for someone like Levinas is just that if you close the holy other down, if you're not sensitive to an element of alterity within the world, then trouble will arrive, right? Trouble will come. So that's deconstruction. Mm. And please ask any questions you want um, in, the, in the notes. Right. Okay, so what then is denomination? So denomination is the name given by Jean-Luc Marion to mystical theology. So what Marion does is Marion agrees with Derrida and says, metaphysics of presence is bad, right? When you think you have justice or God or mercy all sewn up, you end up in, in idolatry. And Marion's particularly interested in the word God, right? Which, so is Derrida, and because the word God is, is almost the preeminent, is the preeminent um, word for this, because the very definition of God is that which is greater than can be conceived, right? So the, the, whenever you use the word God, if you're using it in a precise way, you're literally talking about a kind of reality that you do not grasp, right? So it's not like a, tri like a triangle means three sides, and it's you know, shaped with three sides, or justice, can you can define justice, all of that, but God is a concept that contains within the concept the idea that you can't grasp God, right? So it's a concept that limits itself. So that's a very interesting notion. And it was this that the mystics were, were primarily interested in. So the mystics were the ones who really, really dug into this. This notion that God, the word God, the three-letter word God, is a concept 
that protects you from thinking that you've got the concept. It protects you from thinking you've got God. It's, a, it's an anti-idolatrous word. So Marion is with Derrida, he goes, right, in life we should not fall foul of the metaphysics of presence. And he says, and particularly in religion, we cannot fall foul of this. And then Marion says, the thing is, Derrida, you think that theology is basically the metaphysics of presence, right? So most confessional Christianity is caught up in the idea that God is ultimately present, is, is, um, is the most present of all things, right? Everything else passes out of existence, comes into existence, passes out of existence, but God necessarily exists. God cannot not exist. God always existed, always will exist, exists now, right? So there's... So Derrida is always cautious when it comes to religion, right? Because he's going like, my goodness, this feels like the most um, uh, present of all presences, right? Christianity in its confessional form looks like the metaphysics of presence. Marion's coming in and saying, no, no, no. Um, well, that might be the case. That's idolatrous religion. That's superstition. That's kind of religion that needs to be rejected. That actually theology has a very robust form of thinking that looks like deconstruction and it's where people like Meister Eckhart say God rid me of God right every time I think of God it's less than God pseudo Dionysius who is who plays with this notion of um, that God of being beyond conception beyond our ability to grasp beyond predicates things that you can say of God and beyond negative theology what you can't say is basically Marianne's going like theology brings you to a place of praise and worship not predication so to predicate means to name to define and Marion says that theology at its best is a type of response to not a presence right he says to a givenness so he uses the term givenness to distinguish it from presence. And he said, uh, basically he says that the world and God is a type of givenness. We experience that we've received something. We don't know what we've received, but we've received something that, that, is, that is overwhelming. And our response to that is uh, a comporting ourselves towards it and a gratefulness to it. So prayer is where you kind of point towards the source of all, even though you don't know what the source is or even if the source is. And praise is the gratitude that, that comes out of you for the givenness that you feel. So for Marion, religion, faith, is a form of gratitude and uh, uh, intention towards a prayer and a praise. The the source of everything that is given, even though you don't know how to name that source, or even if the word source is an appropriate name for it, right? Um, and uh, so this is kind of from theology to theopoetics. And Jean Luc Marion calls this experience saturated phenomenon. So a saturated phenomenon, it's a great term, is, um, is where you feel so overwhelmed by something that you cannot grasp it. So in, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm firing a lot of terms into this, uh, into this uh, seminar, so I'm, hopefully I'm defining them as I go, but in phenomenology, phenomenology is a philosophical tradition which is really interested in how we experience reality. Not really what objects are, but how we experience what is, how I experience other people, how I experience um, life, the, what I, what, whenever I talk about God, what I mean by that word. So phenomenology is all about the phenomenon. And in phenomenology, there's this idea that, um, and they call it uh, intuition and intention. Uh, so to intend is concept. So I have concepts in my head. I have a concept of Los Angeles. Um, so that's an intention, that's a concept. And that concept didn't have any experiential knowledge until I moved here eight years ago. So I, I had some, kind, I filled it with some stuff. I'd seen movies, I knew a little bit about LA. So that was kind of, I had the concept of LA and there was a certain amount of knowledge of LA that I had. Then when I moved to Los Angeles, I kind of have more of an experiential 
experiential knowledge of the place and I walk around, I get to know it. But I'll never fully know Los Angeles. No one ever will. It's like a you can never fully intuitively experience everything that Los Angeles is. So there's the concept and there's your experience of it. And Marion says that that when it comes to revelation, it's kind of like the opposite. In most things in life, you have a concept, like I have a concept of the sofa, but um, I don't experience the sofa completely. Like, you know, I, I could know more about the sofa if I was a carpenter, or if I work with leather, or if I, you know, was a furniture salesperson, you know, so there's all these other ways that I could know the sofa and that I don't have. So I have the concept, but I haven't experienced it in all these different ways that I can experience it. But he says, when it comes to revelation, it's the opposite. It's when you experience something so much and your concept is you're at a loss for words. It's not that your words are trying to catch up. It's that you're, you're, you're at a loss. Um, and Marion says that there's two types of revelation, right? There's normal revelation, which is where I can know everything there is to know about riding a bike, but I can't do it. I get on the bike. My, maybe my dad's teaching me and I'm wobbling, I'm falling off. But then eventually I'm able to ride the bike. Um, now I can forget about the concepts of how to ride a bike. I can actually do it. Um, or an example Marion uses, you could know everything about an engine in your car, but if you've never worked with an engine before, you're not going to be able to fix your engine. But you bring it to a mechanic, they're able to work with the engine and they might not even know the theory. Right? They've maybe long since forgotten that they just know what they're doing. And Marion says that that's a type of revelation when you can do something that you don't really know how you do it. Even driving a car, you might kind of, if someone asked you exactly, you know, how to drive a car, you might kind of like get, you know, uh, confused, but you know how to do it. Like when I moved to America, I had to redo my driving test so I could drive. But suddenly I'm having to redo the driving test and I was nervous and going like, because kind of you have to be able to answer theoretical questions. You're going like, of course I know what the signs mean. Of course I know how to drive. But, but when you ask me how to do it, um, I'm a little bit confused. So that's a type of normal revelation for Marion in which you're saturated. Something is given that, that you don't have a conceptual grasp of. And then he says, religious experience is capital R revelation where you're overwhelmed completely, right? All of your senses, your experience, your concepts, everything is, you're overwhelmed. So to such an extent that you are bedazzled, you're confused, you fall into paradox, you start talking about what you can't talk about, you fall into all of these interesting contradictions in your language. And Marion says that is a type of critique of the metaphysics of presence. Because God is not present, God is given. And the givenness means there's something you cannot grasp, something that you do not know. So there's always a humility, always an unknowing, always a lack of grasp within the theological tradition. So what you have on one side is deconstruction, which is a type of, the, the faith of deconstruction is a type of sensitivity to an absence within the word God, within our religious tradition, within our ethical traditions, an openness to that, um, a, a commitment not to close them down, not to become idolatrous. It's a type of desert religion, a religion of the call, of hope for the future. And denomination is a type of uh, religion of excess where you are overwhelmed by something and it's precisely the overwhelming nature of it that means you can't understand it. You're open to um, new conceptions, that you change your language so it's not defining God, but rather uh, maybe an act of praise towards God. So both of them are, are a critique of the metaphysics of presence. Marion thinks that deconstruction is... Um, uh, uh, kind of, it can't, can't be religious, it excludes religion. It excludes an experience of God. Um, and Derrida doesn't think that. Derrida thinks that but God is the name for this openness to the incoming of God. There's, a, there's an expectancy and a waiting. So kind of for one, the Messiah has arrived. For the other, the Messiah is still to come. 
or uh, for both of them, the Messiah is both here and not here. That's why in Christianity you talk about the second coming, the Messiah has arrived, and yet we still wait for the Messiah to arrive. There's, there's somehow justice is here, and yet justice is to come. The kingdom of God is here, yet the kingdom of God is to arrive. Um, uh, yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a here-ness, a presence, and an absence. Now, which one? Uh, is better for understanding religious experience? Um, that is a good question. Um, all I'll say is, I'll say the concerns of both thinkers, and then if you've enjoyed this introduction, I recommend you read Impos Apostles of the Impossible, uh, the essay that's in this book, because um, that will give a, you know, a, an even deeper look at what we've talked about. But basically, the concern of Derrida is that all this talk about hypernimity, so anonymity is when you don't know something because there's a lack of knowledge. Hypernimity is when you don't know something because there is an excess, right? So Derrida's concern with hypernimity and with hyperpresence and with saturated phenomenon and with revelation with a capital R is he thinks that it can all too easily um, fall into this metaphysics of presence. It can all too easily become violent. It can all too easily become proud. Um, and so there's a, there's a danger and deconstruction is designed to always try to strip the danger away by opening the people up to something that is to come, that is still to arrive. For Marion, his concern with Derrida is that he thinks that if you go too far in this direction, you don't have any, uh, it excludes a very important part of many people's lives, which is an experience of conversion or an experience of revelation, right? Capital R revelation. Um, that it kind of like defines that in a way that does not do justice to it. And so Marion wants to kind of like protect that and kind of give what he thinks is a better interpretation of what conversion is. And by the way, for Marion, part of conversion is not just this experience of saturation, but an adopting of a set of beliefs. And you adopt the set of beliefs in order to understand. So there's this idea, and I think it was Anselm who said it first, maybe it was somebody else, but he says that I, I believe in order to understand. So in other words, you, you start by believing so that you can understand something. And what Marion thinks about that is he says that something has happened that you've got no understanding of. You can't grasp it at all, right? This, this change, this bodily uh, experience, this event has happened in your life that changes how you interact with everything. And you've got no way to understand it. So we'd say you join a local church and they give you a language that helps you begin to get a foothold on that experience, to put language to it, to understand it. But that understanding is always also a misunderstanding. It's always provisional, it's always um, incomplete, and it's a denaming, that's why it's called denomination, to dename, it's an unnaming. So you, yes, yes, your theological tradition names, but at its best, it also unnames. Um, so you've, in one of two ways, either you remember that everything you say about God is a type of praise and worship and not a predication. But the better thing is if you have a theological language that auto deconstructs itself. So within Judaism, you have the notion of the tetragrammaton, the four letter name of God that cannot be spoken. So the very tradition itself knowingly embraces this um, this notion of hypernimity, this notion of an absence within the presence, of something unsayable, unspeakable, something that you cannot grasp. And Marion wants to do justice to that. And then Derrida's response is, he thinks that's fine, but deconstruction is the way to keep it humble. <laughs> okay, so that um, is a brief description of how not to speak of God. And the reason why I called it that, I called my first book, How Not to Speak of God. So my first book, is also a deep dive into these ideas. Um, I was particularly inter interested and influenced by denomination when I wrote that book. But the reason why I have the title, which is a play off a Derrida title, is that we both speak and do not speak at the same time. 
there is a type of poetry in which you say what you cannot say. You, um, you name and that you protect the name. And that this, this movement is something that is not uh, provisional to theology, but is central to the very fabric of theological discourse. Okay, let's see if there's any questions. Here we go. Um, so Tim says, how is deconstruction related to dialectics? Right, that's a good question. Um, okay. I say it like this. So deconstruction is, is, is quite critical of the type of dialectics that you see in Hegel that we've done a lot of in the last year um, in, the, in Patreon. Because for Derrida, um, for Derrida, everything has a type of openness, right? So like the current political system will always have uh, openings of possibility for transformation. And the deconstructive thinker is the one who is sensitive to those, those openings for change and for transformation, which, by the way, can sometimes be negative, right? It's, there's no guarantee that that, open, that openness is going to bring you somewhere good, right? There's a fear and a trembling whenever you go into the holy other and into alterity and into the unknown future. There's always a danger. But Derrida is like, right, there's a sensitivity to that, and it's, and it's happening everywhere. In dialectics, the way we've done it with Hegel, is it's, um, uh, so that's difference, everything is difference, everything is, there's all these possibilities. Dialectics is much more um, thesis, antithesis, and, and then the new thesis, antithesis, and this kind of, this movement that's very particular, that there's a, it's not that there's these kind of this fluid openness happening everywhere. There's a particular type of um, antagonism in reality that plays out in a very particular way. So I don't know if I've explained that very well. Again, just kind of painting a broad picture that for someone like Caputo, um, he's like, for example, it's like, um, it's like, we don't have to think about an alternative to the present political system. Right, like like you know, socialism or something like that. What you just look at is what is happening within the current system. Where are the openings for things that are better, like you know, maybe fair trade, uh, maybe kind of in, more environmentally friendly cars, um, kind of like a more um, uh, uh, kind of social security benefits, and you know, you look for these possibilities for to make openings for something possibly better to arise. But you're not necessarily looking to this kind of like large scale transformation. Um, in the dialectics, things are much more kind of there's 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 a there's radical big changes. So the critique of someone like Shizek to Caputo is that the small changes you make within contemporary political system actually just help it run better. Um, it it um, it actually it it feeds it. It keeps it going. And um, you can't actually, there's a central problem that you have to address. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I'll, I'll leave it there. But come back to me if you want to ask anything else on that. Um, uh, Chris, yeah. Would we not be better off regarding our terms love, justice, for instance, as being signposts pointing towards a target, but not as actually getting there? Yeah, I mean, for, for Derrida, that's, that's, that's the kind of case, although slightly different in that, right? Of course, so for Derrida, it's like you never get there. I think you're probably mean the same. So it's a, you could call it a regulative ideal. It's, a, it's pointing towards something that you never get to, that never arrives. Um, but it's that movement and that itself that kind of generates something productive. But I think that, sorry, I think that, um, Derrida uh, also wants to say that the absence is within. So yes, yeah, so there's there's kind of it feels like there's an openness to something in the future, something. But it's a uh, it's part of the definition of justice itself. There's part that it's not at one with itself. So in other words, yeah, I think you're kind of right. But I think Derrida would would say yes. One is like yeah, you're pointing towards something that you never get to. 
and that that pointing towards is within the definition itself. Let me say that. So it's within the, any definition of justice has to define itself in relation to a type of absence, a type of lack that opens up a possibility for something in the future. Um, I guess because the reason is, if, like, if you're pointing towards something, you might have an idea of what that something is. And Derrida always wants to avoid that. He wants to avoid any language which is kind of like, oh, we're not there. We know what there is like, broadly speaking, but, we, you know, but um, we're not there. Um, which is the critique of Stalinism. Stalin, you know, kind of knows where everything's going, so he kind of knows where the future is. But yeah. um, oh, Kate says that sounds dangerously like Tilly. <laughs> that could be very true. Um, let's see, Sarah. Uh, how does this compare to Hegel's approach to the religious? How is he different from the deconstructionists? Yeah, okay, very good. Um, okay. So, right, first of all, like these, they're playing with a variety of the same kind of themes. So for Hegel, what's Hegel's religion in a nutshell is that Christianity is the, Christ is the kind of self-realization of antagonism within the absolute, right? Our under, Christianity as it arises historically is where we come to see this type of contradiction woven into, into the absolute. And so that's, that's what Christianity is for Hegel. Um, Derrida isn't doing that, but wouldn't disagree with it. Um, so Derrida is just sensitizing us to, yeah, see Derrida probably, it doesn't like probably contradiction as much as difference. And difference is kind of like this, he has this openness to the future. So it's, it's less about, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, I'll have to think about it. Because there is a difference, like the reason why Todd McGowan, he's like, so people like Todd McGowan and Slavio Shizek kind of reject deconstruction is because it's kind of like a, um, I don't know if, if you could say this. It's like Hegel, I know, I'll say it like this. And this is true because um, John Caputo was written on Hegel. And so uh, John Caputo's Hegel, he calls it a headless Hegel. And so he says like Derrida has a Hegelian dimension to him, but is with the head cut off. And what he means by that is that that Hegel is basically making a concrete position. He's saying that you know, contradiction is, is in reality. It's an ontological position. It's, um, it's kind of like, it, it, it puts its flag in the sand of what reality is like. Whereas for Derrida, there's a kind of always a rejection of what's called meta-narrative, any narrative like Marxism or Hegelianism or Christianity that kind of makes a claim to absolute truth. De deconstruction is almost like, the sensitivity that the person who always is saying really to anybody who says this is what reality is like. So whenever Caputo talks about a headless Hegel, he says, well, Hegel's got this dialectics and he's got this movement. He's got absence and presence operating within each other, all of that. But then Hegel kind of finishes with this kind of like unification of presence and absence and absolute knowing and a kind of like we have an insight into how reality is. And both Caputo and Derrida, I think, just are suspicious of those kinds of final claims. Um, so deconstruction itself is not a meta-narrative, it's almost a way you position yourself towards all meta-narratives, all grand stories into the very nature of reality. So maybe I would say that, is that, that Derrida is influenced by Hegel, but it's a it's a Hegel without the last two chapters of phenomenology, or the last chapter. It's, it's a, it's a it's kind of almost like an ongoing kind of like openness to the future, but there's no way to close it down. And there is an essay I would recommend. There, I don't know where it is, but if you just type into online, a, there's a review that John Caputo did of a book called The Monstrosity of Christ. And his review of that book kind of goes into 
his um, reject his reasons for rejecting Shizak, but it kind of gives you a really good sense of the difference between that Hegelian and that Derridean kind of approach. And it does it from a Derridean one, so you're not getting it from the other side. So I, I can't remember what it's called, but if you just type in review of the monstrosity of Christ, John Caputo, you'll be able to find it. Um, and Kev, lastly, um, do you see overlap between Marion's revelation and Derrida's undeconstructible? Saturated phenomenon grows out of the openness to experience. Okay, so yeah, you brought up a really good term that I didn't use, which I'm going to say, which is Derrida's undeconstructible. And this is a term that Derrida used later on in his life to describe this. He kind of said, like, everything is deconstructible, but it's like it's the it's almost like it's what what motivates the deconstruction is is undeconstructible it's almost like saying in the Tillich's way of like if i argue about what truth is with you we're already assuming truth because we're arguing so we're assuming that we can communicate with each other that we can come to some sort of answer so but as soon as we try to name what that truth is we're standing on that's where all the issues are so the undeconstructible is truth but every time we speak it it's de everything we speak is deconstructible so when you ask, do you see an overlap between Marion's revelation and Derrida's undeconstructible? Um, you know, it depends which side, right? From Marion's side, they're different. From Marion's side, the problem is the undeconstructible is still kind of it's a come. Derrida is all about absence, all about desert, all about expectancy, hope, and. So Marion always hears within it something different from saturation. Derrida would probably actually agree with that, but he would say, but he's not necessarily against this experience, you know, experience of saturated phenomenon, but he then comes in and says, and then has the what if, has the questioning. So I, I think they both would see them as different. I think one, the undeconstructible, it, see the undeconstructible is, yeah, it's the exact opposite in a way. The undeconstructible is an entirely empty, concept it's a signifier without content it's uh so to use the word truth when i say the word truth i can mean certain things by it but truth itself can be what what lacan calls a master signifier a signifier without any content it's um it's a uh, as soon as I put content into it, it becomes maybe small t truth. Capital T truth is something that I'm always trying to name, always moving towards, always trying to address. But every time I do that, I don't end up with capital T truth, I end up with small t truth. So there's a type of, a type of absence, and saturated phenomenon is the opposite. It's like you're overwhelmed by it, you are, you're like drowned by it. Um, and that's why you can't grasp it. So yeah, but again, look at that essay, um, Apostles of the Impossible, we'll get into that, I think in an even maybe more precise way than I'm describing. Oh, and then there's another one just came in, I guess. Um, given your response to Sarah's question, would you suggest that Marion's and Hegel's approach have similarities? Yep. Oh, mm, uh, in that they both have presence and absence perilously simultaneously. Yeah, um, yes, I would. I think you're right. Again, I, I do keep saying this, and I'm, I keep saying this because I think it can be overcome. And Angus, you were mentioning this the other day, of, I think as well as a way of trying to see how these can be brought together in some way. But I keep kind of like just making the conceptual clarification between a type of... Uh, openness to a future that you do not have and a type of like um, overwhelming experience of what you do not have. And I wonder whether, uh, I don't know how I would describe Hegel, because for Hegel, we are part of the, we are the universe knowing itself. We are the universe seeing itself. We are the universe thinking itself. So everything is playing out. So yeah, so, so you know, there, you could call that a type of saturated phenomenon. You know, we are not separate from the world that we are in. We are kind of like a, a moment within it. So yeah, I, I, yes, I'm just thinking with you. I think there could be a way of seeing the connection there. Um, but I, um, I I'd actually might want to look up and see what Marion's written on Hegel to see, to see what, what Marion says. And another one's popped in, oh, yeah, Mary Beth. 
Traditional Christianity gives you such concrete language to the answer, what do you believe? How do you answer that inside deconstruction or denomination? This is a struggle for me. Yeah, th this is where both of them are critical of any theological discourse that just names, that is just about nomination. Um, now, what, and, and both of them, but Marion particularly, because he's very interested in Christianity, he would say that, that yeah, any of the popular religious language, any religious language that basically says, this is what God is, this is what I believe, this, 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 is, is, a type, is caught up in the metaphysics of presence, is caught up in idolatry. And would, he would say alongside Luther, I guess, that idolatry is our temptation. It's their number one temptation to, to say we, we've grasped the absolute, we know how it works. So, but what Marion would say then is, but the, the mature, Christian tradition and others, but we're talking about Christianity here. Um, the mature Christian tradition has a language that also deconstructs itself, that nominates and denominates, and then turns into praise. And 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 so what what I did in my early work, for example, in the charismatic tradition, is I was trying to introduce mystical language into the community that I was part of, and it kind of worked quite well because. It wasn't foreign. It wasn't a foreign language. Like, de like deconstruction could be seen as a f like a foreign uh, power that you're bringing in, and sometimes people will be more defensive. But denomination, mystical theology, is internal to Christianity, and so you could say that that less mature Christian traditions um, have a very kind of like predicative notion of God, but that the role of the religious leaders is to introduce to the congregation a type of mystical language that, that opens it up, that keeps it fluid, that keeps it, keeps it open, and that that is actually inherently part of the Christian tradition. Um, and so what you want to do, you know, if you're in that and you're going to a church, is probably find somewhere that is less about belief and more about gratitude in response to an experience of givenness. Um, but yeah, this is the problem. I mean, this is the nature of my work. That's why I wrote my first book, How Not to Speak of God, is going like, well, there's an eternal struggle to make sure that religion does not become idolatrous. I mean, Paul Tillich said basically that the role of theology is twofold. On one side is to stop religion from falling into superstition, and on the other side to stop science falling into scientism. So. Uh, superstition is when you know God, you can claim God, you have all the answers. And so theology is actually designed to prevent superstition. And then scientism, on the other side, again, again theology at its best is a language that opens people up to uh, uh, something beyond a merely technological way of looking at the world, where we reduce subjectivity to mechanism where we treat everybody like cogs in a wheel and we treat everything as an economy and we kind of like end up in the, with a, 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 not science but a scientism um, which is like making science which is methodological into a type of worldview in which we understand our, our interaction with each other. Um, and so that, I like that definition because it goes, oh yeah, so theology at its best has a, has a, has a message to the sacred and a message to the secular. <laughs> um, oh yeah, Kev just says, practical application, does the distinction between denomination and deconstruction inform liturgical practice? You know, yeah, th that's the key, is how do they look any different? Because how can, one of the ways of going like, is uh, denomination or deconstruction, right, is what do they look like in practice? And I do think, I do wonder whether they look, hmm. I mean, I have said this before, but when I set up Icon, I was very much reading this stuff. And I wanted a place where it didn't matter whether you were a deconstructionist or a denominationist, right? That, uh, because both of them were a type of openness, a cracking open to future possibilities to the unknown. And so what you find in Icon is someone, you find literally someone who think it was a crypto theistic space, bringing people who don't believe into kind of a more religious environment. And some would think it was a crypto atheistic space designed to bring people who believed in God kind of out of that. And you know, both of them could sit at a table and agree, or both of them could say, um, I'm here because I love God. 
but both of them because one of them could say but i don't believe in god um, I, and the other could say i don't know what god is when i use that term and so and all of that's welcome so in other words icon started off just as a community of the critique of the metaphysics of presence of the notion of god as containing an absence um, a non-conceptual dimension um, so the question is but yeah do do they look different and um maybe you could say it's a difference between jewish mysticism and christian mysticism maybe right jewish mysticism um is just doesn't generate much conversation right so like if you look at the jewish tradition often what's important is that you keep a kosher home you have the traditions belief in god is not that important talking about god is you know <laughs> not that important right it's the practices Christian mysticism generates this excess of speech about how you cannot speak. So Christian mystics are constantly talking about what you can't talk about, right? Um, Marion would say that's evidence of, of being overwhelmed by something, and whereas the lack of speech is as a type of faith in what is to come. So maybe that's, but, but I think you could critique that distinction. I'm just thinking that's maybe what Marion would say, is that, that um, the faith of deconstruction it isn't really caught up in um, a lot of talk about God and what you can't say about God, um, uh, whereas Christian mysticism is. <laughs> um, cool. Oh, you keep going, my goodness. Oh, yeah. Uh, you're just making a comment, Sarah. I'm just going to read this out. It's interesting to think about practice in two ways. One is the types of liturgies that emerge from them, and one is the type of liturgies that we can design after considering them both. Yeah. You know, all the stuff I made came out of these discussions, right? So the Last Supper, Atheism for Lent, the Omega Course, um, uh, there was another one, I, you know, uh, oh, and, then, and then Transformance Art, all of those came out of kind of like be sitting with these conversations. And um, there's so many more practices that I think can come out of them, but it was interesting that I don't think Atheism for Lent or the Last Supper or the Omega Course could have arisen if I hadn't immersed myself in this critique of the metaphysics of presence. I think that, that they were kind of practices that naturally arose, that could only be conceived from the conversation between these two, these two positions. All right, well, listen, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, there's a happy hour after this, just to hang out um, uh, on, on Zoom. Uh, and the details are in the calendar and maybe at the top of the comment section um, and I will see you all very soon I don't know what the next thing is but um, I'm sure I think it might be next week it might be coffee and concepts so talk to you all then bye bye